Okay, Timmy. Yeah, let's hear it for Timmy. Can I pray briefly? Lord, thank you so much for Timmy. Thank you for what he's prepared. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless him, fill him. And uh, would you continue to minister to us, Lord Jesus, this morning, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, Shadwell. Good morning. Yeah, 75%, you're getting better. Good morning, Shadwell. Thank you very much. Could we, uh, could we give it up for the band? I, I was just um, was worshipping along with them and just vibing in the corner. It was, it was a very nice, very nice way to be this morning. But um, my name's Timmy. Uh, I have the privilege of being one of your two church wardens here. Um, and I've been part of this wonderful church family for, for coming on nine years this summer, I believe. Uh, and today, excited to share with you from the Word of God. Last week, as, as Mark mentioned, Phil and Philippa took us through some of the amazing work being done to fulfill our vision of, you know, making disciples and transforming communities and planting churches all across London and Tower Hamlets. So there's always stuff happening here at SPS, at, at All Saints Poplar, in Bethnal Green. So, so do ask the team if, if you want to learn more about it or, or if you might even want to get involved in some of the work and outreach that we're doing. There's, there's some great ways that you can uh, help us spread the good news of Jesus around Tower Hamlets. Um, and to be honest, for my part, I actually live a little down the road in Newham. Uh, yes, Newham Massive. Where we are? Yeah, yeah. Newham is in the building, uh, but Newham is great. There's lots of variety there. You've got, uh, you know, the, the skyscrapers of Canning Town have just been popping up. I'm not sure what's happening there. Uh, Stratford as well. Uh, and then you've got loads of great parts. We're actually bordered by water on three sides. There are three rivers all around Newham. I don't know if you knew. Can anyone name the three rivers around Newham? The River Lee, yeah, Adele fame. The Thames, yeah, that's a pretty obvious one. <laughs> <laughs> along the south. I thought it would be first, but okay. And Roding. There's a new boy. There's a new boy. Yeah. The Roding goes up the east side of Newham just, just by barking. I think there's some barking massive in there as well. No? Mm? No, barking's not here today. Uh, but, but, but I love it because it's so nice to be by water. Water is very calming, you know. Um, other aspects in Newham, you've got parks, great parks in Newham. You know, I'm sounding a bit like an estate agent today. <laughs> Give you a bit of a tour guide of Newham. Uh, but I particularly appreciate parks and, and you know, being outside and, and green spaces because uh, I grew up just on the outskirts of London um, next to a farm with, you know, cows and, and plowing and all sorts going on. And, and so, so I feel like a bit of an earthly, earthy kind of guy. Um, and, and you don't get those same smells, those same, you know, experiences when you live in London. Yeah, it's, it's quite a different experience when you're on the tube and you're you know, in someone's armpit. Or you're, ooh, doesn't happen much to me, you know, good height. But the rest of you, I'm very sorry. Um, but the way my mind works, that is what came up when, when I heard that I'll be preaching this morning on the parable of the sower. You know, it reminded, oh, someone clocked it in advance. Very good. Did you like, did you like my segue? <laughs> uh, so when thinking about the parable of the sower, it, it really brought me back to that. You know, growing up in that kind of earthy place, different kinds of soil. Uh, if you want to check out some soil, we've got allotments, mini allotments at the back, um, which I'm sure have got all sorts in them. But this parable is really just designed to be a relatable story to help Jesus communicate, you know, huge, deeper points about, you know, life and death and salvation and the kingdom of heaven. This one comes in Matthew chapter 13. At the start of what is, is basically like a mini Netflix series of parables. Um, you know, you've got six of them there. And, and Jesus really recognized that he needed to share stories with a deeper underlying meaning. You know, to be perfectly honest, a, li a little bit like Black Mirror. I don't know if anyone's seen Jonah's Awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit freaky. Um, but, but, but in those days, knowing that the common man was, you know, very familiar with agricultural matters, familiar with earth and soil and, and seed time and harvest. You know, Jesus tried to make it super relevant uh, to the people around him, make sure that they could understand what he was talking about. And in the same way, I think we have that challenge when we are sharing our faith. 
Uh, but today's reading is very kindly going to be brought to us by Kaylee, who I, yes, great, is coming up now. Um, so Matthew chapter 13 for us. Matthew chapter 13, the first part taken um, in verses 1 to 9. The same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, whilst all people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and birds came up and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but then the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then from verses 18 to 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what is sown. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amazing. Thank you. Give it up for Kaylee. So this, this really is, is quite a deep parable. Um, and as I mentioned, it's the first of six in this chapter. So I definitely recommend you go away and, and have a read of, of the rest uh, when you get a chance. But, but I also have to issue a bit of a trigger warning that, that you know, Jesus never shared these kind of things just to, you know, leave you something to think about or, 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 or you know, wonder if you might be challenged. He really wanted to challenge the status quo. He wanted people to look at how they live their lives and look at how they perceive the things around them. He really wanted to challenge the Pharisees of the day, you know, the leaders of, of, the, of the temple and such. And so we have to look at our priorities when we hear parables like this from Jesus. You know, I've literally been holding a mirror up to my life over the last couple of weeks as I prepare for this morning. And as I was reflecting and, and praying on the passage, it actually became clear to me that my understanding, maybe as a child, of, of what the parable of the sower meant is maybe not quite where Jesus wanted it to land. Um, you know, I, I maybe thought that uh, it was about finding people in the good soil or finding people in different places and you know that's just where they were and you know that was their stage of life or that was what was going on in them um, and that would just be the season they were in but then it hit me that actually it's not about finding or happening to be the right kind of soil it's about choosing to be the right kind of soil or in the right kind of soil you then can be the right soil for the seed which is the word of God, the gift of salvation. There is nothing passive about this Christian faith. You know, everything is about accepting what Jesus did through his death and resurrection, but then acting accordingly off the back of it as well. There are choices to be made. You know, will you accept this free gift of salvation? Will you live a life in response to that gift of grace that says thank you for it? Uh, And will we go out and tell those around us about how great a life it can be? There's nothing passive about those choices. And in the same way, I believe we are called not just to accept where we are currently in our hearts, but actually to proactively work on finding ourselves in the good soil. So my title for this message is Choose the Good Soil. Say it with me one time. 
choose the good soil. You know, the beauty of this parable is that all of us in the room right now can probably relate to one of the four places, one of the four different kinds of soil that Jesus described. Uh, But the even greater beauty in it is that that doesn't need to be a permanent state. You know, I want to encourage you that Jesus wants to see you, wants to see all of us in the good soil living out to the max. You know, there are ways that we can transition from wherever we are right now. And as long as we make a conscious decision and effort not to be passive in this thing called life, change is possible. A change of mindset is possible. But any married couples in the room? You're very quiet, married couples. (laughs) Is it going well? (laughs) Yeah, good. Uh, but, But, you know, you might have found yourself in this kind of scenario realizing that you as a husband or wife cannot change your partner. It really needs to be... I know you've tried, Steve. <laughs> it really needs to be their conscious decision, their conscious choice. You know, you might, you might be trying to get them to, uh, and I've heard of this one recently, actually. You might be trying to get them to, to stop chewing with their mouth open. Oh, hit a nerve. Hello. You can say it all you want until they decide that they want to have some table manners and, you know, give you a peaceful meal. They're not going to change. It has to be their decision. You know, uh, another one I heard, ooh, oh yeah, this, this might hit. Oh, I heard recently, a lot of husbands are spending a lot of time, you know, saving the world on their PS5. <laughs> he needs to decide that he's ready to balance his time between the video game world and his family life, you know? Uh, or, or the classic, I would love it if you would spend more time with your mother-in-law. Oh, sorry, darling, I'm a bit busy. Busy or choosing. You know, there are choices that we can make that are selfless uh, in, in any of those scenarios. But it takes a change of heart to see the action come out as a result. Whether it's husbands and wives, whether it's with our parents, whether it's with colleagues or siblings, you know, we, we need to choose the good soil as a matter of choosing the priority, choosing the priority in our hearts. So let's start with the path. Let's start with being in that place of being on the path, for example. Um, You know, the passage says from verse 19, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So this is about just not getting it. You know, for, for something to make it deep into your heart, you need to truly understand it. Our faith is easily picked off when, when we haven't worked on setting it up with a deep-rooted foundation uh, based on the word. You know, in Proverbs chapter 4, arguably the wisest man to ever live, King Solomon, said this. He said, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. You know, we are called to make that effort to increase our understanding of the Bible you know, of the gravity of what Jesus did in his relatively short ministry and the implications for how we should live our lives. You know, I think it was Albert Einstein who said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. You know, do we all have that, I hate to sound slightly salesy, but that 30-second elevator pitch of what our faith means to us, what our salvation means to us. If someone catches you and asks you, why do you love Jesus? What what are we going to say to them? And if we're not quite there, come and learn. You know, Alpha is a great place to learn. How many people have done Alpha? Yeah, great body. Uh, Alpha is a great place to learn. Our our Thursday Bible study, Deeper, uh, should be starting up after the summer, I believe, as well. Another place to learn in a safe and and welcoming environment with with your church family. Um, But a place to increase our understanding of God's word. Or how about getting into a, a reading plan on the Bible app? You know, some amazing topics there from from love and relationships to to depression, to hope, uh, you know, to to dealing with the fruits of the Spirit. Loads of stuff that we can cover um, that that maybe doesn't get covered as often as you might want it to on stage here because we can only cover one thing a week. But, But those Bible plans can take us through many, many things if we take the time. And they help us to make our heart the good soil rather than a place where the gospel easily gets picked off. Even if it's just five to ten minutes every morning, you know, start small and build. 
read slow, see what the passage has for you and the implications for your life. If we have time for a podcast, we have time for the Bible. Then the next ground we encounter is the parable uh, or the the verses around the rocky ground. So verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Now, we we all know that life can be hard. We all know that it has its challenges. Uh, But the the real challenge is how we respond. You know, I I remember reading a book that talked about how it's, it's the event plus the response that equals the outcome, right? And especially if or when that problem or persecution maybe even comes as a result of our faith. You know, the people around us not necessarily understanding or whatever it might be. You know, it's one thing when we face challenges that are truly out of our control. But when we've made a choice and it, it brings us into a place of, of difficulty, I know that's quite different. I mean, this, this is a slightly flippant example. But uh, I, have, I have a best friend who loves wearing hats. And he's always got, you know good sharp hat, whether it's a baseball cap or a trilby or whatever it might be, and I look at him with envy because the issue I have is I have a massive head. <laughs> and you might not be able to tell now, I've kind of grown into it, proportions <laughs> just about there, but, but my mum will tell you I've, I've got a big head. And so, you know, I can't change that. I can't wear the hats I would necessarily want to all the time, but I can just about get through it. But, but when we've chosen to be followers of Jesus... And there are still things that affect our lives negatively. You know, what happens then? Even if, like the passage, we we came to Christ full of joy, do we always stick it out? uh, Or do we sometimes fall away? You know, take a bit of time away from church, away from being around the church family because we want to get there ourselves. You have to remember that Jesus was talking like this because he knew that we would face difficulty. He knew we would face persecution. He knew his disciples would face persecution, prison, and even death because of their faith. The challenge we face culturally, even today in this city, is pretty real, it's pretty visceral. You know, Phil talked last week about how we are are one of only 0.4% of people in the Tower Hamlets borough who actually go to church on a Sunday. No, we are massively in the minority. And even some of what we believe puts us directly at odds with the people around us or those we work with or those we come in contact with on a daily basis. But with our hearts in the right place, there is hope and there is a promise. Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, that, that's a sermon all on its own. But there is protection on offer from our Father in heaven. You know, maybe we'll come back to it. But, but the next verse is actually my biggest encouragement. Verse 18 in that chapter says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. When we choose the right soil, prayer becomes our go-to response to anything. You know, how am I going to get through this day? I'm going to pray on it. You know I, don't know, I don't know what to do about my family situation. I'm going to pray on it. Nothing is too big or too small for God. So he wants us to fall to our knees in prayer rather than fall uh, away like the seed on the rocky ground. An active prayer life can help bring the change of heart we need to stick out those situations. Um, strengthened by the only one who is there and big enough to see us through any situation. Even a situation full of thorns. In verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Gosh, worries and wealth. Wow. Uh, this is where it starts to get a bit more punchy. Uh, and we'll start with the, you know, the softer of the two. There is so much to worry about in this life. You know, we've, we've got global conflict, we've got energy crisis, we've got an NHS crisis in this country now, or even closer to home, a cost of living crisis, remortgage crisis, all the crises are going on. And they're very real and very worrying. A natural response is, is to kind of freeze and, and not know what to do. You know, that deer in the headlights. Uh, your throat might close up, you might feel choked. 
Uh, but don't let these thorns choke God in you, you know, because that's when you'll need him most. This is the time to open up the good book and go to somewhere like Psalm 55, where King David, who was mighty and wealthy and powerful, you know, still offered some encouragement that we need to cast our cares on the Lord and he will sustain us. He will never let the righteous be shaken. There is no promise that we won't have cares and difficulties and worries in life, but there is a promise that we will be sustained. That peace immediately helps you navigate whatever you're facing with greater clarity of mind, with greater connection to hear from your father, and really understand what he might actually want you to do. And I'll go into more depth on the topic of wealth and stuff later, but, but, but it was Jesus who said that we should seek first the kingdom, and everything we need will be added unto us as well. So don't let the hustle culture of today you know, distract from the two central goals that we have as followers of Christ, which are quite simply to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's it. Not the house, not the car, not, not the holidays. All are very, very nice, but they're not the goal of this kingdom life. If we truly love God, we prioritize spending time in his presence. If we truly love our neighbor, we make sacrifices for them. Now, what a world it would be if we all put the same focus and effort into being there for others that we do on chasing after other things. You know, and don't mishear me. Jesus, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, self-care is bait. I'm never going to argue with that. And, and for all of us, that means different things. For me, <laughs> it means going away to focus with my church family, which is great. But staying in a hotel 10 minutes down the road because sleeping on the ground is not my idea of fun. That's not a holiday. That's struggle life. But no judgment at all. But if you want to come stay at a hotel, I'll share you the link. Uh, but, but all of that, the lifestyle, whatever it might be, being comfortable shouldn't take priority over choosing the good soil. So cast your cares on God. That's, that's how we move from, from the thorns to the good soil. Eliminate worry and distraction. Right, so a quick pop quiz. See how you've been listening. So how do we move off the path into the good soil? Yeah, feed on the word, get understanding, absolutely. Uh, how do we get away from the rocks into the good soil? Ephesians 6, yeah, full armor of God. Um, prayer, really connecting with our Heavenly Father. Uh, and the last one there, we've gone from thorns to the good soil. How do we do that? Cast your cares. Yeah, absolutely. Cast our cares. Or seek, seek the kingdom first as well and rely on the Lord. Now, I'll ask the, com the band to come up. There's a little more, but, but this is probably a good slot for you guys. So that brings us to the target state, the, the, the optimum, you know, the, the real life goal. Uh, I said it at the beginning, say it with me, choose the good soil. So we really want to find ways to choose the good soil. As verse 23 says, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. But how? What does it mean to hear the word and understand it? To me, it's about living it out. Uh, as I said at the start, nothing Jesus said was just for discussion and debate. You know, he was really trying to provoke action, provoke change. A change of thinking or a change of lifestyle. And, and you know, lifestyle is quite a buzzword right now. I think, you know, through various means, we are now able to see the different lifestyles that people lead in a way that we didn't, you know, 50 plus years ago at all. Uh, and it, it, it can really challenge us. The lifestyle that Jesus was talking about, though, isn't easy, but it is rewarding. Producing a crop yielding 160, 30 times what was sown. And this isn't a return on investment for good deeds that, you know, comes into your bank account or anything like that. The result of living this life is that we get to show an example to the world of, of what Jesus is like and what a Jesus life is like. You know, setting an example draws people to Christ. And what could be a better reward? What could be a better crop than that? 
episode four of this series of parables um, talks about the kingdom of heaven being like one who is finding treasure in the field or, or a precious pearl. You know, that person goes away and sells everything they have to take possession of that treasure because it is so valuable. It is so worth it. You know, uh, the early church used to sell all their possessions to do good, to give to the poor, um, to be able to do more. And, and I just have to look at the world that we live in now, that, that in the West alone, I've, I believe the statistics are something like we, we waste or throw away enough food every day to feed the world's hungry twice over, which is just crazy. We're not sharing with the world in the way that we possibly could. Because that's what the Jesus lifestyle is about. It's about triggering us into action. And so to, to, to help understand what, what this lifestyle looks like, um, I've got a couple of book recommendations. I think there's a QR code as well if you want to go shopping on Amazon for them. Um, the first one is, yes, The Deeply Formed Life uh, by Rich Velodas, which is a great book. He's a, he's a preacher out of New York. And, you know, he, he looks at how we can really try to live a life modeled after Jesus. So really worthwhile taking a read. He's got five principles in there for us to follow. Um, <laughs> But that then led me on to read this second one, which is very punchy. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Who's read this book? Yeah, I know a couple of people. You look, you look like you know what I'm about to say. This is a book that even just reading the blurb, you will, you will feel a punch to the gut. It's, um, it's, it's quite strong. And, and you know, when I, when I first saw it and heard about it a few years ago, I thought, mm, I'm not sure I'm actually ready to go through this process of, of changing the way that it's going to call me to change. You know, I, I know my, myself. I'm a very all or nothing kind of person. Uh, you know, I'm the kind of person who watched Cowspiracy once. I stopped eating beef, pork, lamb, all of it. Went straight away. Like if, if something hits me, it provokes me to action. And I hope you're the same. So, so I managed to get through it at the beginning of this year. And it left me with such an impression that I wanted to share with you quickly now. Um, the four principles that I think are really, really effective for helping us live the Jesus lifestyle. So helpfully, they all start with the letter S. Uh, you've got silence and solitude. You've got Sabbath. You've got simplicity. And then you've got slowing. And I'll explain them all very, very briefly. Uh, but, but it works out quite nicely because we love alliteration here at SPS. And he did it for me. So great. Thank you. But first, silence and solitude. So this was modeled perfectly by Jesus. You know, even right at the start of his ministry in Mark chapter 1, it talks about how very in the, early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The Savior of the world needed silence and solitude to really connect with his Father, to hear from him, to, to get a sense of direction, just to reset at least. You know, and it's tricky for us in our 24-hour news cycle life that we live these days, in our phones constantly in our hand, telling us what to see or what to read. You know, there's a meme that I want to share with you. I saw this recently after Zuckerberg and co. had launched another app. You know, uh, This is me trying to uh, use threads and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok and YouTube. How, how are we supposed to juggle all of this? I really don't know. And so it has been a conscious decision for me at least that the first app I open in the morning is the Bible app. You know, I make sure that I'm starting my day with the Word of God. And quiet time sounds like one of those, you know, old school church ideas. But it just means finding a place and a time of stillness to really connect with our Heavenly Father. You know, leave your music off in the morning or, or, or come home from work and don't switch on the TV. Any time of day can be shared with God. Then there's Sabbath. You know, right back in Genesis, uh, God did all the work of creation in six days. And then he rested. Big God. God is massive. And he still rested. You know, I don't know who we are that we think that we can get through seven days relentlessly doing stuff and think we'll be okay. We're not built for it. You know, Sabbath is from the Hebrew word uh, Shavat, which means to rest. So it's pretty clear what this day is supposed to be about. Rest and fellowship. And, and worship how can we take it as a day to connect with loved ones and family members church family you know I've, I remember during the pandemic and in lockdown many of us were watching you know 
two, three, maybe even four different church services on a Sunday because we had nothing else to do. <laughs> but now we just about make it to a 10 a.m. in the morning and then we find other things. I would encourage you, can you bookend your Sunday? Can you make it at 10 uh, and make it to the 6 p.m. as well? Find a time to connect with God afresh, even twice on a Sunday. And the third S is simplicity. Now, I'm still working on this one. Um, but remember we talked about moving from the thorns uh, and looking for the good soil by seeking the kingdom and knowing that everything we need will be added. So simplicity is really just about contentment. What do you really need in this life? Now, if you're doing Sabbath every week, how many trips do we need to take if we're actually already well rested? How many you know, near identical little black dresses are in the wardrobe or, or pairs of blue jeans that, that we can only wear one at a time? I know I've got a lot of trainers. I'm not an Olympic athlete. <laughs> How can we cut down? You know, when I think about the author, his wardrobe is actually just four or five simple outfits that he wears on repeat, which blew my mind. Um, but, but it challenged me to the point that, that this year, 2023, I haven't bought any clothes since last year. And believe it or not, I still have things to wear. How has that happened? You know, it's a real challenge that, 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 you know, Jesus even talked about when he said that we can look at the lilies of the field and, and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. King Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. If God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Contentment over consumerism. It leaves room for God and it leaves resources for us to bless others and bless those around us. And then finally, slowing. Now, this year, 2023, or, or whenever this study was done, we're actually sleeping three to four hours on average less than those who were, you know, just 100 years ago at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and it somehow becomes super cool to be really busy where, you know, we, we get that FOMO. We want to be at the drinks. We want to be at the party. We want to be at everything that's going on. We want to work hard and play hard. But, but it shouldn't be, expense at the, it shouldn't be at the expense of our peace and our proximity to God. We don't need to be everywhere. We don't need to rush around. We don't need to respond to every email or text message within 30 seconds to show that we're still connected. You know, Jesus was active. He was in these streets. He, he was around people all the time. You know, his first miracle was, was opening the bar up to, to the wedding so that everyone could have a bit more to drink. You know, he made sure 5,000 people could stay together having fun on that hillside with, with as much food as they needed. But after those intense moments, he slowed right down. He found time and space to reconnect with God, to really gather his thoughts. And so for us, maybe it means, you know, just doing one appointment a day or on a Saturday rather than two or three and stacking and fitting in as much as we can. Or maybe a, a rest week once a month where, where we do absolutely nothing but relax and chill out. Because on top of that, our, our chilling out is, is not even really chilling out. We still often have devices or TVs or stimulus in front of us that gets the mind going and doesn't allow the mind to rest. You know, I want to be really provocative and see, you know, how about we know, cancel our TV license? go to a state of not near oh you felt that one didn't you <laughs> like do we need to be in the nine o'clock news every day is it, is it giving us something is it feeding the heart is it helping us to be in good soil how, how about we take different apps or social media apps off our phones and maybe just connect to them on a, on a laptop or a computer at a specific time so we know that that's when I'm going to connect in that way rather than constantly scrolling so I said it was going to be punchy but you know, we are not built to multitask. I, ca I can't even write a text while someone's talking to me. I can see some of you smiling because you know this is true. I can't even write a text while someone's talking to me because my, my brain is not set up for two things at the same time. It just doesn't quite happen. But there are loads in the, of ideas in the book um, that, that can help with this. And at the end, it, it, it talks about how the Apostle Paul summed it up perfectly when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Even so, dear brothers and sisters... Make it your goal to live a quiet life. 
This is all about a change of heart, a change of priorities. And so to help, I'd actually like to do a, a, a Mark Bishop and offer these books to a couple of people who might want to get started. Thanks, Mark. Inspiration. Yes. Which one? Yeah, let's go punchy. Ruthless elimination of hurry. There you go, my friend. And anyone for Rich Velodas, deeply formed life? Yes, that hand went up quickly. Okay, so my only request is that once you've read it, you share it. Spread it around the church, pass it, and, and at the same time also share what you've read. You know, these conversations are really important for us to have. You know, this, this quote I saw from a Danish theologian, um, Kierkegaard, he said that, that the Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. So let's pray as we um, think about choosing the good soul. Father God, thank you for your word and for your example. Lord, we know that if we're on the path, you can help us to get wisdom and understanding. We know that if we're on the rocks, you can equip us and help us to put on the armor of God and pray to you without ceasing. Lord, if we're stuck in the thorns, I pray that you would uh, help us to cast our cares on you and seek your kingdom first. Lord, help us to choose the good soil and a lifestyle that cultivates that good soil in our hearts. Help us to choose the Jesus lifestyle. 